How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening or watching DNA Today. We are a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I'm a prenatal genetic counselor. And on this show, we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in the field. So we're talking to other genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and more. My guests today are Dr. Richard Michael Moore, director of the UC Davis Genome Center, who developed and leads the Davis's COVID-19 testing and genotyping. And Dr. Brad Pollack, who is the director of the Healthy Davis Together Project, who is also the UC Davis Associate Dean of Public Health Sciences. Thank you both so much for coming on the show. This is certainly a timely topic. Our pleasure. Very welcome. And we're going to be focusing today on genotyping for COVID-19 variant surveillance. So we're going to get into like the genetic side of COVID-19. Before we start out, Dr. Michael Moore, it would be great to hear from you in terms of giving us background information on what type of virus COVID-19 is, because as we were talking before we started recording, a lot of our audience is genetic counselors and people that may not specialize in virology. So if you could provide us a little bit of background there in terms of the type of virus we're talking about. Okay, so SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. It's a member of um, RNA positive strand RNA viruses. It has a fairly large genome for a human virus. It's got about 30,000 bases. And uh, fortunately, it's actually, it isn't one of those really robust protein encoded viruses. It's in a coating of lipid with with four structural proteins. So it's relatively easy to to disinfect. And, um, you know, talking about variation, viruses vary all the time. And the replication of viruses tends to be error prone. Now, most of those changes are inconsequential or maybe even deleterious, so they don't propagate. But occasionally, some of those changes will actually confer an advantage to the virus. And one of the things, of course, the virus wants to do is to be more infectious. So when SARS-CoV-2 moved into humans, it wasn't really tremendously well adapted. It is actually remarkably uh, fairly well adapted. But some of these changes that have occurred have resulted in strains that will be more infectious. And so when we're looking at COVID testing, when people are like, oh, I got a COVID test, it's negative or it's positive, Mm. are there different types of COVID tests that maybe the public isn't as aware of in terms of there's not just one, there's multiple? Definitely. Um, Can you tell I knew the answer of that as I was asking it? (laughs) That's a a good prompt. So broadly, that kind of two types of tests one of which is it tests for the presence of the RNA. And they tend to be PCR based so that they amplify up and they will specifically ask, can I detect a particular part of the virus? And different tests, different PCR tests will detect different parts of the virus. So you'll see the different kits from the different companies. They'll say it's the N gene, the S gene, different letters for the protein genes that are being detected. The good test will detect two or three different targets. So they're not affected necessarily by a, a cha- one change. Then you have another group of tests that try and detect the presence of the protein. So these are antigen tests to be distinguished from antibody tests that detect whether you've been infected two, three weeks ago. So the antigen tests tend to be more rapid, but tend to be a little less accurate, though Uh, the whole field of diagnostics will never be the same again. So many technologies and so much money and so much ingenuity has been poured into diagnostics that the whole field of diagnostics, and I'm sure it's going to impact genetic counseling tremendously, as I say, is never going to be the same again. You have these quick point of care tests and then the, the speed of the PCR tests and the scale, the number that we can conduct is definitely going up. Can I just add, I think, uh, and, and, and Richard put his finger on it, so the, the antigen tests have really been evolved 
to, to give you rapid results. And those are the sorts of things you'll see when you have a 15 minute test. They mm -hmm. tend to be not quite as accurate, of course, compared to the PCR methods, which require you know more laboratory work and a turnaround time of many, many hours usually, if not a day or two. Um, the other tests, which we really have poo-pooed a lot, are the serology tests, and that is the antibody tests. And uh, in epidemiology, those have often been used to get an, a snapshot of a population to have some idea of what the prior exposure to the virus was. In other words, if people have developed antibodies, in many cases for some viruses, you'll get antibodies that are very persistent that could detect that the fact that you were diagnosed and or you were you were infected two or three years ago, right? So we do look at those sorts of things. Um, and in fact, when the pandemic began here, you saw a number of population surveys being done, for, for example, in Santa Clara County, California, Stanford did a study where they were trying to assess how many people had been exposed or infected with the virus historically, and they came up with estimates. And, and those are, they're much less useful, though, for active planning and moving forward, because they don't tell you who is infected now. You could have had an infection six months ago, developed antibodies to it, maybe they were persistent, maybe not. In fact, there's some evidence that they're not very persistent, and then you, you test zero today. So they're not as informative, but each of these different testing modalities can be used in different contexts to give you, you know, slightly complementary information. Another useful distinction is clinical testing yeah. versus uh, public health testing. And one of the characteristics, actually, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 is that many, uh, many infected individuals are asymptomatic. The whole medical clinical industry is set up to detect, to uh, to diagnose symptomatic individuals. But given that 50 or 60 percent of the infected individuals will not be symptomatic, that puts so it outside the normal clinical workflow. So this is something we did at Davis: was you had the clinical testing in the hospital, where you really need to know if someone's infected. But then you need high throughput, inexpensive testing for a public health context of asymptomatic individuals. So we kind of had these parallel universes. Yeah, and, and they're, they're, uh, they, they are complementary if you use the right way. I, I'll just point out one of the flaws we've had to deal with was the federal government didn't know how to regulate these the right way. They're, they're really only regulating in the context, and you're, a lot of your listeners will know from genetic testing, are these CLIA certified, you know, uh, uh, tests. And when you're dealing with population testing, where your intent is to try to catch somebody who's got an acute infection, you know, you don't necessarily want to rely on having something that's going to be as convoluted. And in fact, at the beginning, remember, many of the academic medical centers were given 20 test kits a day to use on the original medical test. And that was clearly insufficient to do anything. So um, I think what we've seen though the difficulties we've we faced are that the regulatory agencies the FDA in particular really wasn't thinking about this second track which is the population based based testing which really is a different intent and I think Rich and I both agree that I mean these are complementary you don't have one without the other you do need to have the medical testing as part of this but it's not sufficient to try to roll that out on a population basis the way that things were structured and what role did the UC Davis Genome Center play in the pandemic response and just how you handled things and how you developed testing? Right. So we just mentioned that the clinical folks were taking care of the hospital. They had supply chain issues and they thought you're running 300 tests a day, 500 tests a day was high throughput. I come from a sort of ag biotech background. And I knew there was technology out there that could generate millions of data points a day, millions, orders of magnitude, more than what the clinical set folks were thinking about. And the Genome Center is uh, set up to provide high throughput, or well, sorry, high complexity tests of different types. So we repurposed the Genome Center. We had skilled personnel there. We weren't really used to doing quite the high throughput, but I reached out to uh, contacts in the ag biotech industry and we then collaborated with LGC to move their technology into uh, running. And it's no sweat for us to run 5,000 tests a day. We could push it up to 8,000 if we wanted to. In fact, in theory, we could do um, 24,000 tests a day. But the challenge is not the molecular biology. It's actually the sample acquisition. Yeah. The human side. <laughs> right, of just processing that many samples it's and getting them right. into systems. 
Yeah. Right. Well, acquire, acquiring those samples, yes. Yeah, and, see, acquisition is much more challenging. Once yeah. the sample gets to the lab, no problem. We can handle thousands and thousands of samples a day. And then how does Healthy Davis Together fit into all of this? Sure. And that's a really nice segue because, uh, it, as Richard said, it's the acquisition that's the challenge, right? Um, of course, the technology side is, was, was challenging, but the, the issue is how do you actually get samples? How do you actually get people to volunteer to be part of something where they're going to be tested, especially in the context of asymptomatic individuals, right? So that means people are, they feel healthy. There's no reason for them to get tested, right? You're, you're asking them, could, would you please submit to getting tested? Now, one, one of the things that I think was, again, very clever, Richard and his crew had, uh, and we, we did talk a lot about this, but it made no sense to try to do nasal pharyngeal swabbing for a large number of people in the general population. And I know if any of you had, uh, you know, the, the, the test done, it is, you feel like your brains are going to be <laughs> rubbed out when they do that. So that's not a very viable way of doing this on a mass scale. So we did move to a saliva based platform to make the acquisition a lot easier, much more acceptable. You spit into a small tube. Um, but the Healthy Davis Together project, it's actually fairly comprehensive. And the intent of it was really to look and see whether or not we could control COVID-19 in the Davis community. So it was really taking a lot of what we had put in place already for the campus control with students moving back last fall, you know, making sure we had the appropriate uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions for public health measures, as well as the testing, and then expanding our bubble from the campus to the whole community. And it's, it's actually a fairly large project at its core, there are really two major approaches that are being used to control COVID. One of them is the epidemiology infectious disease control. And so that's where testing is, is the central piece for that. It's testing, it's identifying positives quickly, doing case identification, contact tracing. And then for those individuals that need to be separated out, that is positive cases or high risk contacts, it's providing isolation and quarantine. So the idea there, the testing is critical to get people out of circulation so they're not infecting others. So that's really the infectious disease control component of Healthy Davis Together, along with wastewater monitoring. So we're looking at trace levels of virus in the wastewater. And there's some other things that are involved too, including vaccination, which really comes under the same heading. But back in June of 2020, we didn't have a vaccine to available. So that was a future project to be d d expanded out. The second half of the Healthy Davis Together project is really focusing on health behavior change. So as you've, you've maybe heard some epidemiologists say, you can't test your way out of an epidemic. So all the testing in the world is not going to fix you from having this population explosion. So you have to incorporate in behavior change where people are going to separate out, you know, masking was part of that, social distancing, obviously learning, you know, indoor, outdoor use of spaces and so on. So the other half of Healthy Davis Together was to put together a package of mass communications and uh, interventions, including incentivizing individual behavior, getting business partners involved to try to move the, the dime, the, move the needle forward in terms of the health behavior change. So when you combine epidemiology with health behavior change, you result in you know real positive effect. And we're now seeing that now. We're looking at the numbers of cases we've had in the Davis community, and they're much lower than control areas, including in the same county as well as other cities around the state. Um, so I think that that's important. But I, I want to point out here that it's really the combination of the technology platform along with the sort of the people side of things. How do you get people in to get tested? And that has not been any small feat. We've had probably a little over half the population of Davis that have submitted and had at least one test done, but getting people to do this on a frequent basis when they don't have to, theoretically, it's taken a lot of communications, a lot of messaging to try to do that. And even now, more so when the CDC has come out with guidelines for fully vaccinated individuals, and they said, oh, you don't need to test unless you're symptomatic. We're really not happy with that advice because of the issue of variants creeping up now and breakthrough cases. So anyway, I think these plat the platform the testing platform, which is critical, and then having the effector arm of being able to get people into the system, that combination there has really been very powerful. And you brought up a good point of the next phase maybe of this pandemic of looking at the variants. I think when we started with the pandemic, we're like, COVID-19, is it there or not? But now we've gotten so much more information as we've we're in. We're recording this in, in June 2020, 21. Um, so looking at this, I mean, what is a COVID-19 variant? Like, how are we tracking this? 
Yeah, good question. So, as we mentioned earlier, the virus is changing all the time. But most of those changes are inconsequential. But if they confer an advantage, you're going to see them increase. So, if, if any, people don't believe in uh, evolution, just tell them to look at what's happening with <laughs> SARS-CoV-2. I mean, it's evolution in real time here, guys. So, what you see is there'll be a response to a selection pressure. And the major selection pressure up to this point has been for increased infectivity. If you have a strain of the virus that's more infectious, it's obviously going to become prevalent. And that tends to occur when you have better binding of the so-called S protein to the receptor on the, on the human cell. And there's a limited number of amino acids on that interface between the uh, S protein and the receptor. And so what we've seen actually is the same changes, same mutations have occurred in multiple locations in the world. Wow, so it's it? not just one place we've seen it solely evolve. We're seeing no. this evolve differently in places, yeah. but in so, parallel. Yeah, so there's um, a mutation, L452R, otherwise known as Larry, um, right? And another <laughs> one, the E484K. These mutations have occurred multiple times. So L452R, it occurred in the UK first, uh, the so-called B117 or now the alpha strain. It occurred in the South African strain. It occurred in the Brazilian strain, completely independently. Is this right? something we would have expected? Because you're blowing my yes. mind a little bit now. I mean, this isn't okay. my area, but it, that, it's, that's shocking it's so to me. Called, it's so-called convergent evolution. So what you've got to realize is that the because the um, replication of the virus is error prone, it is essentially exploring all sorts of evolutionary space, right? As I say, most of that space is not advantageous to the virus, but few times it will be. And if it's a big advantage, it's going to, you're going to see it over and over and over again. And the technology that we developed, uh, we took in from the ag biotech sector, was actually set up to detect DNA changes in plant breeding materials. SNP assays, so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms. So it was a complete no-brainer that we just said, okay, we know how to do this, is to develop assays in, con in collaboration with LGC that will detect these changes that you see over and over again. And then with a relatively few number of changes, I can tell whether in fact it's the alpha variant, the beta variant, the gamma variant, or the delta variant because they have a different pattern of these advantageous uh, reoccurring mutations. And so we now test 100% of our positives. So we run our test and it's fast. So we're returning many of the results, close to 40% of our results, we return the same day. And over 90% of the results go back within the next day. And then we take those all the positives and run them on our so-called SNP assay. And therefore, within a few days of someone spitting in a tube, we know what the variant is. Now, it isn't 100% of the time because uh, you need a certain amount of virus in your tube. And so we actually run the test on 100% of positives, but we don't necessarily get data back. But it's the same with sequencing. Sequencing also can't give you a sequence on 100% of samples. And the, the sensitivity is about the same. But a point I would make with the genotyping or the SNP genotyping is it's complementary to sequencing. It doesn't replace sequencing. It, it blatantly stands on the shoulders of sequencing. So you need to sequence a certain percentage all the time to look for those new variants. But then when you know what variants are circulating, you can develop your SNP assays so very quickly. You know, within a few days, you know what variant. And you, so the point about the problem with sequencing is it's expensive, it's technically more demanding, and it's a lot slower. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the sequence information you're seeing, though it's getting better, but it was often four to six weeks after the sample was collected. That's no good for real-time interventions. Right. But we need that sequencing to design the SNP assays to know what we've got.
So the two are complementary. So is it those two variants that you mentioned specifically that Davis and maybe other places are looking for, or is that just two exactly. examples of a list of many can, uh, variants? Um, you can pretty much tell what you've got of the major variants right now by running half a dozen SNP assays. But you'd like to have a little bit of redundancy in your calls. So, uh, you know, we run about 12 to 14 SNPs, which is probably overkill, but I'll, I'll have three changes that will tell me whether I've got the alpha variant. I'll have three or four change, no, two or three changes that will tell me whether I've got the delta variant, right? And actually, there's a new version of the delta variant that has one of the other changes at 144 that was seen in some of the other strains that hadn't actually been seen in the initial delta variant. So the delta variant is acquiring more of these advantageous mutations. And because the, because the same assay is informative over and over again, we can pick that up. And with that then, is there, you know, you're talking about the alpha, beta, the, the different really almost types of COVID-19. Are, are, are there one that is more infectious or one that we're a little bit more like scared of, for lack of a better word, that we're really having our eye on in terms of it getting worse and more contagious? Yeah, so the V117 or the alpha variant was the first one that really came up. That was about 40 to 60% more infectious than the sort of standard strain that was going around at the time. Now the new Delta variant is 40 to 60% more infectious than the alpha variant. So it's really quite infectious. It's building upon each other. It's, then. Yeah, it's selection, right? If, if it's an adva uh, advantageous to be more infectious, you're going to be more infectious. Now, another thing about viruses is it isn't actually in their best interest to kill you, right? They're reliant on you. In fact, the ideal virus will propagate, be highly infectious, but asymptomatic. We have individuals walking around with some of these variants that have incredible high numbers of, uh, uh, I mean, for, for the aficionados, we have asymptomatic individuals with a CT value of 12 or 14. That'll mean something to some of them. I mean, that is just <laughs> mind blowing, right? But they're asymptomatic. Yeah. I, now, no, can I just sorry, finish my yeah, train sure, of thought, otherwise yeah, yeah. I'll lose it. Yeah. Now we talk about selection pressures, right? So the, the selection pressure at the moment has been for increased infectivity. But I could not design a better selection experiment that's currently happening in the US, where you have a steep selection pressure called vaccinated individuals. And you have a large number of infected infectious individuals that are not vaccinated, that are basically presenting variants all the time against this selection barrier. Up to this point, we really haven't had a steep selection pressure for variants at scale to overcome the vaccine, but it's now there. So there are, I don't want to be alarmist, but there are I and others basically think it's just a matter of when, not if, there will be variants that overcome the vaccine, and the, or to varying extents. It may not happen all at once, it may be gradual. Some of the uh, strains do, um, and the vaccines are effective against it, but not quite as effective. So you could see stepwise in terms of selection, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. All right, so you, you'll, you'll see this stepwise thing. So, you know, there's this talk of preparing for the next pandemic. Is it another virus that blows in from animals, bats, whatever? I personally think the next pandemic is going to be variants of SARS-CoV-2 that overcome the vaccine. And what we're doing in terms of monitoring is essentially practice for when that happens. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna add, and, and, I, and, and I think the interesting thing here is that the other element uh, and where we might reduce the chance of having this huge challenge is really the speed at which we vaccinate. And it's the, right. the pool of unvaccinated that are left in the population. So I want to just emphasize and, and amplify what Richard said, which is we're, we're going to see this big battle happen. It's, there's going to be something coming along that's going to challenge the current cadre of vaccines we have available in terms of their efficacy. 
And but that is much less likely to happen if we use the Blitzkrieg lightning approach and really yeah, got exactly. everybody vaccinated all at once. Because if you do that, you reduce the pool of individuals who are infected, and that's where the mutations occur. So you want to try to eliminate the pool. So it's it's not just a, a constant time issue here. It's really this issue of trying to hit it hard, fast up front. And what you're seeing, unfortunately, globally, is you're seeing rates that are highly variant, very, very different across the, the, the globe. My son's moving back from Columbia, South America on Friday, but South America now has one quarter of the COVID deaths and only, what, about 5% of the world's population. So they're, it's just rampant down there. Uh, even in the United States here, we've got these pockets of parts of states where you've got highly large numbers of unvaccinated individuals. So uh, I think that this this battle that's brewing here, and I, I would agree with Richard that you know we may see this mega battle happen. We really want to try to put out all the fuel ahead of time, get rid of the fuel before that fire gets lit, because we don't want to see that happen. And of course, the vaccine manufacturers are trying to stay, you know, on top of this. This is where the role of boosters will come in, where we can reformulate. And unfortunately, with the messenger RNA vaccines, these are much easier to reformulate to add in the additional uh, you know, response for these these new uh, mutant types um, than you had in the old conventional vaccine development world. So that's good, but you know it's very difficult, and we don't know. The problem is we won't know when that battle is actually starting to get won in certain areas, and and we may be reverting back to a lot of these horrible lockdown measures and outbreak things that we've had to endure for the last year and a quarter. How do you keep research articles organized? I've struggled with this as a student for years, and now as a genetic counselor, I have so many papers saved on my Mac, but it's often hard to find one and even harder to cite when I'm writing. I finally found a solution though. It's simple and easy. It's called Paper Pile. The goal of Paper Pile is to radically simplify the workflow of collecting, managing, and writing papers. This app allows you to highlight and annotate papers, manage references, share and collaborate, and get this even cite directly in Google Docs. I wish I had discovered this when I was doing my thesis, would have saved me hours of time and frustrations. At every step, PaperPile aims to provide a just work solution that eliminates any unnecessary complexity. Especially with PaperPile's new mobile apps, you can sync your library to all your devices so you can read and annotate on your iPad, iPhone, or Android devices. So if you're a student, researcher, writer, really anyone who's downloading and reading papers, you gotta check out PaperPile for a streamlined approach. You can start your 30-day trial at paperpile.com with code DNA today. Paperpile costs only $36 per year, but with code DNA today, you save 20%. Again, that's paperpile.com for all your papers in one place. Nice and tidy. And when it comes to talking about like the booster vaccinations, I mean, obviously hard to say, we're speculating, but you know, coming from your research and what you've been seeing, when do you expect that we may be needing those booster vaccinations? I know for me, I was vaccinated right at the end of December 2020 because I'm a healthcare provider, you know, in yeah. person. Um, so I was one of the first to get it. Yeah. So will people that were on that front end of getting it first be getting the first to get the boosters? Is that how you expect it to work? Is that going to be years down the road, months? I mean, uh, good. Those are great questions. And I think the manufacturers who already have boosters in uh, early trials um, are uh, are trying to, to sort through that. W one thing I will say from the regulatory hurdle standpoint is the boosters will not require the same level of FDA uh, review and then scrutiny that you had in getting the first emergency youth auth auth use authorizations. So they're, they've been kind of granted in like the, like the influenza vaccine that they're not gonna have to go through the same level of regulatory review. And they have them in prototype right now. The, the, but the questions you asked have not really been answered yet, Whether you, which order you go in. And it may be much less a function of when you were vaccinated, right? Because we're, we're all getting the same vaccines. It's what viruses are present, what variants are present now, not how long you've been vaccinated. Uh, there are questions about vaccine longevity and so on. But you know, I think even Dr. Fauci you know, said, we're probably looking at two or three years at a minimum. That's not the problem. The problem is that's that's for the wild type that the vaccines were all developed for. So it's 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 an interesting situation for us to be in with this race against time and where boosters will come in and how, how they may be able to thwart this. But I, again, I, I fear Richard's uh, battle scene scenario here, which is the boosters aren't gonna be around fast enough to necessarily deal with that outbreak when the when the battle is being won in some local areas. That's That's my fear. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and we'll just have to see as it 
plays out as we've been doing for the last year and a half or so. Um, but thank you both for coming on the show and just sharing your expertise with us. It is very, very needed. And people can head over to healthydavistogether.org to learn more. And obviously, the CDC is going to be the best resource in terms of you know anywhere you are in America. Um, so thank you so much for coming on and just sharing this perspective on just where we are and, and where we're headed. I think that's where a lot of people are focused. So thank you both so much. Thanks, Kira. You're welcome. Good chatting with you. And people can head over to dnapodcast.com to learn more and listen to all 150 episodes of DNA Today. You can connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and all of the social media by searching DNA Today. And if you have any questions for myself, Dr. Paula, Dr. Michael Moore, please email in info at dnapodcast.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, you learned something, please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this. This is how we're going to have more people be learning about genetics and become educated so that, you know, as coming from the pub public health perspective, as we've been talking about today, how important that is. So thanks for listening, everybody, and join us next time to learn, discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. DNA.